the Quran claims that all the scriptures have been altered by men and this is why God sent a new revelation to correct the manipulations done to his older books. Quran claims that it has zero errors and contradictions because it's not written by people. And to prove that all the scriptures have been modified and manipulated, you should look for contradictions in them. Do they not read and reflect upon the Quran? If it had been from any other than God, they would have found within it much contradiction. Let's see if we can prove that claim to be right or wrong. Open your Bible with me. Number 1. Luke 3 23. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Matthew 1 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Did you notice something strange here? Who was the father of Joseph exactly? Luke says it's Heli, but Matthew says it's Jacob. These are two pages in the Bible, and one of them at least is a lie. Which one is it? Number 2. Acts 1.18 With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all of his intestines spilled out. What a shameful death. Matthew 27, 5. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, then he went away and hanged himself. Did you notice something strange here? How did Judas die exactly? Acts says he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. But Matthew says he hanged himself. One of them at least is a lie. Or maybe both. Who knows? Number 3. 2 Kings 24, 8 Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 3 months. 2 Chronicles 36, 8 Jehoiakim was 8 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 3 months and 10 days. Did you notice something strange here? I think you did. How much time did he reign in Jerusalem? 2 Kings says he reigned 3 months. Two Chronicles says he reigned three months and ten days. Which one is it? And how old was he when he became king? Two Kings says he was 18 years old when he became king, but Two Chronicles says he was eight years old when he became king. One of them at least is a lie. Maybe both. Who knows? Number four. 2 Kings 8, 26. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king. 2 Chronicles 22, 2. 40 and 2 years old was Ahaziah when he became to reign. Did you notice something? How old was Ahaziah when he became king? 2 Kings says he was 22 years old, but 2 Chronicles says he was 42 years old. Which one is it? And if you check the evolution of the Bible over the years, they keep changing verses in it. They keep modifying and removing information and adding information. If you check this exact verse, 2 Chronicles 22, see how many times it was changed, and sometimes they say it is 42 years old, and sometimes 22, based on their whims and what they want you to believe in when you read the next version. So if the final version of the Bible we are reading right now was being changed and manipulated over the years by men, how can we consider it God's words? Number 5. Book of Ezra 1, 9-11 this is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. Whoever wrote this verse didn't have a calculator, because the total is 2,499, not 5,400. And absolutely, God didn't make a math mistake. If it is not God who wrote that, then who? And why are we cherishing this person's book? Why does this person deserve our full obedience? He just was a guy without a calculator. Number 6. At the time of writing the Bible, the best minds of the world believed that the earth is flat. It was their understanding based on their own scientific knowledge. Now let's read. 
Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Whoever wrote this thinks that if you go on top of a very high mountain, you can see every country on earth. He didn't know yet that the earth isn't flat, but of course God already knew that. So do you still believe that these are words of God? Check this one out. Jeremiah 16:19. The nations will come from the ends of the earth. Someone please explain to me where are the ends of the earth? Job 37, 3, and sends it to the ends of the earth. Again, where are these ends of the earth? Isaiah 11:12. from the four corners of the earth. Looks like the earth is flat and has four corners. Whoever wrote this thought that the earth is like a square piece of paper with four corners. God, of course, will never say that. Revelation 7.1 And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. Again, whoever wrote this thought that the earth is flat square with four corners, and there is an angel holding each corner, so the wind will not blow it. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 7 Whoever wrote the Bible thought that mountains are the pillars and the foundation of heaven. Without mountains, heaven will fall on us. Job 26, 11. The pillars of heaven tremble. 2 Samuel 22, 8. Then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the heavens trembled. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 8. Jonah 2, 5 and 6. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. Whoever wrote these verses describing the sinking story of Jonah thought that if you go deep in the sea, you can actually go under the land and under the mountains. He thought that the continents that we live on and the mountains are swimming over water. He even didn't know that mountains have roots deep underground. Psalm 136, 6, who spreads out the earth upon the waters. Again. I don't know why they think that the whole earth is a big ocean and continents are like big boats floating over them. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. For the third time, guys, we should believe that Europe is a very big boat floating over the water. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 9. Genesis 1, 6-9 And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated water under the vault from water above the vault, and it was so. God called the vault sky. This is the complete concept of earth based on the Bible. Water under, water above, and both water areas are separated by the earth and the sky. So the whole universe is endless amount of water, and the earth and the sky is in the middle. This is why the sky is blue, because there is water over it. And don't forget that the mountains are the pillars of the sky, holding the sky up. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 10. Genesis 1, 3-16 and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. This is the first day, remember that. Number 16. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars, the fourth day. So God created light and day and night in the first day, then God created the sun and the moon and the stars in the fourth day. Don't you think that they should have been the opposite? How were their light and day and night before creating the sun and the moon and the stars? Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 11, Genesis 3:14. After Adam and Eve ate the forbidden tree, the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. First of all, serpents don't eat dust. 
Second of all, if one serpent made a mistake somehow, why should all the innocent newborn serpents crawl on their bellies too? Does that make sense to you? Is that your idea of God? Do you think God is a childish angry kid who cannot control his fury that he punishes newborn serpents for a sin that they didn't commit? What about number 16? To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Do you really think God hates all newborn innocent women and made them all suffer pain for a crime that they didn't commit? Do you really think we have an unfair God? Do you really think that God is full of hate towards one gender? Maybe this is why God chose to have a son, not a daughter. In other words, do you think God is sexist? Or does it make more sense to believe that God isn't and this book was written by a sexist person? Number 12, Leviticus 11, 20 to 23. All flying insects that walk on all fours are to be regarded as unclean by you. There are however some flying insects that walk on all fours that you may eat. Number 23, but all other flying insects that have four legs, you are to regard them as clean. There is one problem with these verses. I will give you a second to guess. There are no insects with four legs. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 13, Mark 4, 31. It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. There is one problem with this verse. I will give you a second to guess. Yes, the mustard seed is not the smallest seed on earth. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 14, Leviticus 14, 52 and 53. He shall purify the house with the bird's blood. 53 and it will be clean do you think god is telling us to use the bird's blood to clean our houses should we start buying bird's blood instead of detergents do you still believe these are words of god number 15 numbers 5 12 to 31 this one is too long you can just pause the video and read it yourself it says that if a man doubts his wife and he wants to know if she is faithful to him or not he should take her to a priest then the priest shall take some holy water and put some dust in it and then tell her that if she was faithful to her husband this water will not harm her but if she cheated on her husband this water will bring a curse on her May this water bring a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. The problem is I think dirty water with dust most likely will hurt her stomach, whether she was faithful or not. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 16. Genesis 2, 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God has finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Rested. The God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Do you really think that God was tired after working six days he needed to rest? Is this the image of God you are worshipping? A God who gets tired and needs to rest? Do you still believe these are words of God? I wouldn't be surprised if they wrote God needed to drink coffee on the sixth day or something. Number 17. Genesis 32, 28. The man said, From now on, your name will no longer be Jacob. You will be called Israel, because you have wrestled with God and with men, and you have won. This verse describes a very amusing wrestling round. Jacob versus God. Who do you think will win? Exactly. Of course Jacob won the fight against God. Maybe because God was tired from creating the heavens and the earth and he needed rest. That's why he lost against Jacob. 
Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 18. Jesus states that the believers will be able to handle snake bites and will be immune from any poison they might happen to drink and will be able to heal the sick. Mark 16, 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I haven't seen one believer until now who can handle snake bites and drink poison and heal the sick. Actually, even religious leaders themselves, which represent the best of believers, when confronted with this, they refuse to drink poison. My brother has given me a deadly poison and he wants me to drink it. <laughs> He wants me to make a show and tell you that it is true what is written in Mark 16, that if we drink something that is poisoned, we will not die. Now, very strange, you see, I believe in God. I have experienced the Holy Spirit and in our family, we have experienced the Holy Spirit as a reality. And the Holy Spirit tells us what is going to happen. And my wife told me, Thursday night, Stanley, be careful, someone will try to poison you. <laughs> if you want to kill me, I must have five minutes more. <laughs> just going to tell you that in front of Herod, Jesus did not open his mouth according to the scripture and Jesus did not make a show of the miracles and when you gave me this question today, I recognized the devil in you and I'm not going to obey the devil, I'm not going to make a show. What are you afraid of man? Aren't you a believer? Don't worry, you will be fine. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. He will never drink it because he knows it's a lie. And he will never admit it's a lie because he makes his earning by lying to you. If he admits it's a lie, he will lose his job and fame. He will be just a poor guy without income. He's saying that this man in the audience is the devil. But the verse says that believers can cast out devils. Why don't you cast him out? The real victims here are the poor innocent people who believed in the Bible and followed it blindly and got severely hurt because of that. a famous preacher whose faith centered on a passage in the Bible promising protection from snakes. A rattlesnake took his life. Jack Wolford, a renowned Pentecostal serpent handler, died after suffering a bite from one of the snakes that he used to show his devotion to God. <laughs> Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 19, 2 Chronicles 18, 21 to 22. I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing them, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. These two verses alone destroy the whole Bible. They clearly say that God put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours. 
if this verse is true, then all the information we got from these prophets is false. And if the information we have from these prophets is true, then these verses are lies. Choose one. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 20. 1 Samuel 15.3 Listen now to the message from the Lord. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Do you think God will order the killing of women and children? Do you think God will order the killing of infants? Infants? Even donkeys? Why donkeys? Are these the words of God or the words of a terrorist? Number 21, Numbers 31, 14 to 18. Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands, and commanders of hundreds who returned from the battle. Have you allowed all women to live? He asked them. Now kill all the boys, and kill every woman who had slept with a man. But save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Do you believe that God ordered Moses to kill the women and the boys and to leave the virgin girls for the men to enjoy them? This is exactly what happened in World War II by Soviet occupation troops in Germany. Hundreds of thousands and possibly as many as two million girls were raped by troops. Do you believe that supposedly Jesus is the God of Moses and Jesus commanded him to kill women and rape virgins? Are these the words of God or the words of a terrorist? Number 22 Leviticus 25:44. Your male and female slaves are to come from nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. 1 Peter 2, 18 Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters. Titus 2, 9 Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. Exodus 21, 20-21 Everyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. Do you think that God permits enslaving people from surrounding nations and beating them up with a rod, but while making sure they don't die in the process? So you can beat up your slave until he or she has internal bleeding and broken bones, but as long as he or she stay alive for a day or two, it's okay, since they are your property? Don't worry God, I will make sure they don't die on the same day as me beating them. They will struggle from internal bleeding and broken bones without dying on the same day. And that's okay, I think, because they are my property. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 23. Deuteronomy 25, 11-12 If two men are fighting and the wife of one of them comes to rescue her husband from his assailant and she reaches out and seizes him by his private parts, you shall cut off her hand, show her no pity. Sisters in humanity, don't defend your husband, or they will cut off your hand. Seems like whoever wrote this verse had a problem with women kicking him in the crouch. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 24. And this is a really nice one. Genesis 19.32 Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him, and preserve our family line through our father. That night they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went and slept with him. The next day the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight, and you go in and sleep with him. So both of Lot's daughter became pregnant by the father. While in 2 Peter 2, 7, it says, And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. So Genesis describes Lot as an awful human being, but Peter describes Lot as a righteous man. 
So is he a righteous man or a man who gets drunk every night and sleeps with both of his daughters repeatedly until he gets his own daughters pregnant from him? Which one is it? Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 25. 2 Samuel 24 9. Jacob reported the number of fighting men to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 able bodied men who can handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. 1 Chronicles 21 5. Jacob reported the number of fighting men to David. In all Israel, there are 1,100,000 men who can handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. So were there 800,000 men in Israel or 1,100,000 men? Were there 500,000 in Judah or 470,000? Is the first one lying or the second one lying? Or both? Do you still believe these are words of God? A tetraquinic takes the ancient manuscripts of the Bible, the pieces of parchment that were found all over the world, and he has to learn uh, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, you know, these languages that these parchments have been found in. And he has to take these scriptures and try to find out where they came from, uh, why there are variations in the many different versions of the same parchment. Let's say you have Matthew chapter 1 from the Bible. There might be 5,000 different variant readings of Matthew chapter 1 in six languages. And so he has to be able to take all these and sift through them, try to find out why there's so many variations of the readings, and then determine which one is the original. Um, and that's not as easy a task as seeing you could figure, you know, which one of the oldest is probably a more original, which is not the case since there are no originals. Uh, you might have one parchment that is the oldest parchment of the of the of the group, but it might be a copy of 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 a copy with with laden with mistakes. If you read about Noah in the Bible, there is the story about Noah saving uh, uh, humanity from the flood with an ark and all of that. There is this in the Bible. There's other another aspect to the story of Noah that that not many people know about unless they actually take time to open a Bible. This will not be preached from any pulpit anywhere. Is that the, the Bible says that Noah was an alcoholic. This is the Bible's portrayal of Noah, or Nuh salam, that he was an alcoholic, he was a drunkard. This is the word used in the Bible, that he was a man given to alcohol. And <clears throat> I'm a psychology major, and my, my, my uh, field of specialty is mental illnesses, and, and alcoholism is one of those, is, is a mental illness. And I know from seeing alcoholism's effect on one of my close uh, friend's parents, uh, I know that someone who is truly addicted to alcohol, and if Noah lived for so long addicted to alcohol, he was seriously addicted to alcohol, um, it is hard for someone addicted to alcohol to hold down a nine to five job working at McDonald's flipping hamburgers, much less construct an ark to save humanity from a flood that's never happened. So that stopped me for a moment in my tracks. And I said, no, it was an alcoholic. You know, and, and it, it bothered me for a minute because I said, I, you know, things started popping in my mind like, if Noah was a drunkard, how did he know God was talking to him? Because, you know, I've seen some people, the alcoholics, you know, you were just asleep in my dog's food bowl the other night drooling and now you're telling me you were talking to God last night. You know, this, this you know, to rationally that would not make sense to me. That's like, you know, an alcoholic on the street coming to you and tell you God's talking to him. You know, he has no, this would give this man no validity. This man has no validity with anyone. So, I didn't pay it too much attention. It caught me, but I said, you know what, I'm going to keep going because there's one thing that you don't do in Christianity and I'll tell you what it, was, it is in a minute when I started doing it. Um, then I came across the story of Lot or Lut salam, and we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in these stories but there's a, another very twisted story in the Bible about Lot and his daughters. There's a story of Lot and his daughters uh, uh, in, in, in the Bible that says his daughters got him drunk one night and seduced him and committed incest with him. This is, the Bible, this is one of the Bible portrayals of the prophets of God. And it says that David saw, uh, saw this woman named Bathsheba, and she was one of the most beautiful women of her time. Uh, and she happened to be married to one of the commanders of his army named Uriah. But David on this day decided that he was not able to resist his temptation uh, to be with this woman Bathsheba, so he did. Uh, and he committed adultery with her. And knowing that he did this, he, the, the, the way that he decided to cover it up was he sent a letter to the generals of his army saying that when the battle was fierce for everyone to pull back and abandon Uriah uh, so that he would be killed and when he dies then he could have Bathsheba, no harm, no foul. So David went from being the slayer of Goliath 
the hero from man to uh, an adulterer, a, a, a plotter, and a murderer. And so this is when I really caught myself and said, hold on now. Something's wrong here. Something's got to give. I said, because to me, God's prophets in my mind were people of example, people who I could follow as an example, someone who was supposed to be the best of us so that we could follow them and emulate them. And I'm, they're turning out to be worse than some of the people that you see on America's Most Wanted. David is somebody that if I only knew this about him from the Bible, I see him coming down the street, I'm going the other way and calling 911 because he has to have a warrant out on him for something. This is what I'm thinking in my mind. This man is not an honorable man at all. He, he, okay, he killed Goliath, yeah, but he killed this other guy named Uriah to be able to commit adultery with his wife. So I, 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 did, I committed the cardinal sin in Christianity. I started asking questions. Um, this is the one thing you do not do in Christianity is you don't ask questions, especially not about issues like this. Um, so I went to my pastor and I started asking questions. You know, what, what, what's going on here? You know, pastor, there's, there's a, a very bad recurring uh, habit about these men in the Bible. What is, what is the deal here? And I remember he told me the same thing that I, almost every pastor or every evangelist or anyone I talked to about this, same, same, same answer, almost like it was programmed. They would put their hand on my shoulder and say, Brother Joshua, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith because you're not justified by knowledge, you're justified by faith. Uh, and they would quote me verses like, lean not on understanding, you know, Paul's, we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, this is all, they would quote this whole line of thing to me like it was already pre-programmed, they, like they programmed in pastor school that people are going to ask you questions and here's the answer. Long after the death of Moses, some of the believers started changing God's message to us and made up some stories about him and made a very interesting decision that if you're not born to one of them, you cannot be one of the believers because God is exclusive only to them and their children. And then they disbelieved in Jesus. They are not following God's teachings anymore. They made up their own man-made exclusive religion. And now instead of calling them believers, we just call them Jews. Unfortunately, the same happened with Jesus. At first, people followed him and obeyed God, and they were believers. Jesus ordered people to follow the laws of Moses and be more righteous than the Jews. Matthew 5.17 Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5.20 Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus actually told people that if you do not follow the laws of Moses perfectly, even more than the Jews, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven or paradise. Then after Jesus, one Turkish guy called Paul claimed that while he was traveling in the desert alone in Syria, he talked to God. And then God told him that Jesus made a mistake asking us to follow the laws of Moses and we should not follow them anymore. And all the laws of God are garbage. Everything that Jesus taught or did in his life is a curse. And by the way, he was the son of God and he died for our sins. So now we can sin as much as we want. It will be forgiven because God killed his son already. He literally used the word curse to describe God's laws for humanity. Galatians 3.10 For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. And now people disbelieve Jesus and believe this Turkish guy who claimed to be talking to God and asking us to ignore what Jesus commanded. We can't call them believers anymore, sorry. We have to call them Christians. Which is very ironic, because they think that everything that Christ was doing and asking people to do is a curse. That is exactly what their new prophet Paul said. The more accurate name will be Paulians. I'm sorry, that's the truth. If you need more details on how Paul invented that new Christianity, check our video Bible Proves Jesus is a Prophet. Complete reference. Link is in the description and first comment. There was one litmus test that I used for every religion. And when I saw it, whenever I met them or the people or whatever about this religion, I would always ask them, do you have a book? Do you have a book? Because another thing I had come to the conclusion of is that if your religion is true, you should be able to ha tangibly hand me something and show me that this religion is true. Give me something that I can see. I don't want to hear that faith stuff anymore. I heard that all my life and it look where it got me. It got me thinking I'm driving a Mercedes running around in 1982 beat up Datsun. I said, no, you, you have to show me. 
And I, so I read the Bhagavad Gita, I read the Torah, I read the Scrolls of Tao, you know, I, I read the, the, the Code of the Bushido, I read the Wiccan Book of Spirits and Spells and all that other magic stuff they have. And I read all of these things and I found something very congruent with all of it, was that there were very same philosophies and teachings in all of these major religious books. Uh, they all talked about God and His nature. Uh, most of them alluded to the fact that God is one and that God sends messengers to us and people to us to teach us. But they were filled with a whole bunch of, of, of garbage, to be, to be honest with you, that I couldn't logically, rationally believe. Um, so at about the age of 17, just about, the time, about 17, um, 17 and a half, I, I gave up my search for uh, God. And I became kind of angry with God, but I said, here I am looking for you, and I can't find you, and it doesn't look like you're giving me any help. And I don't know how many of you know, but for a 17-year-old is frustrated with God and the world, there's a lot of trouble he can get into. There's a lot of things he can do uh, to put himself in predicaments uh, when he's frustrated with the world and, and had come to the conception that, you know, if there's a God that exists, then he doesn't really care about me. You know, that's a kind of a dangerous young man. Um, so I started doing the whole partying in trouble. Um, uh, going to parties, drinking underage, all of this stuff I started doing, you know, I, I'm a perfectionist at heart. Uh, so when I was a Christian, I tried to be a, 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 the best one I could. If I was going to switch to being uh, any other religion, then I was going to do that 100%. So you better believe when I went after the dunya, I, I did that 100%. Every time God sends a prophet to tell the people to go back to his laws and commandments and to worship him only, people change their religion and teachings and make up their own man-made one. There are many more contradictions and mistakes in the Bible, but we don't want this video to be hours long. You can Google yourself who wrote the Bible, when was the New Testament written. You can even find the torn pieces of ancient paper found in random places and somehow became a belief. The most important question now that you need to ask yourself do you really believe in a God that makes laws for you to follow and then tells you, Oh, I made a mistake, sorry, don't follow them anymore, I will kill my son instead? Or do you really believe in a God that is exclusive to only a group of people and it's forbidden for anyone else to believe in him? Or a God that thinks that the earth is a flat square with four corners sailing over water? Or a God that thinks that mountains are the columns that hold the sky from falling on us? Or a God who doesn't know that mountains have roots? Or a God that thinks that the sky is blue because there are more water above it? A God who doesn't know how Judas died and have mistakes in several historical events? A God that tells you to wash your house with bird blood to make it clean? A God that thinks that holy water with dust in it will only curse unfaithful women? A God that encourages slavery and tells us to beat up our slaves but make sure they don't die on the same day because they are our property. A God that cannot make simple math calculations a 60 year old kid can make. A God that tells his prophet to kill women and infant children and to keep some virgin girls for the army men to rape. A God that tells his prophet to kill all the animals for no reason. A God that hates snakes apparently and makes them eat dust. A God that hates women and punishes all of them by labor pain for a sin that they didn't commit. A God that hates women so much he decided to have a son, not a daughter. And then got angry and decided to kill his own son because he lost hope in us following some simple laws. Oh, you can't stop eating pigs? Okay, no problem. I will just kill my son so you can eat as much pig as you want. Really? Do you really believe in a God that tells you that if you defend your husband who is getting attacked, they should cut your hand? A God that thinks that mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds on earth? A God that thinks that insects have four legs? A God that needs to rest in the seventh day after creating the heavens and the earth? and then wrestles with Jacob and loses the fight? A God who puts a deceiving spirit in the mouth of his prophets and let them teach us evil religion? A God that doesn't care that people keep changing his words until now? A God who is telling you to take up snakes and to drink poison? A God who created day and night before he created the sun? A God who thinks that a man who repeatedly sleeps with his two daughters until they are pregnant from him is a righteous man? Really? 
And when God finally sends you a new error-proof book with zero mistakes and zero contradictions, giving you the same laws and the same teachings, while clearing the mistakes and manipulations that have been made to his previous books, you don't even want to give it a try and read it.